Okay, so hello everybody. Welcome to the talk. Um, atomic variables, not radioactive, but you probably still don't want to touch them. Uh, I'm Roy Margalit, and I hope you'll learn something and, reason and get to know the fact that you shouldn't be touching atomic variables. So, as we all know, computers have not been getting any faster in the last 20 years. They pretty much stalled on the CPU frequency. But instead what happens is that they just multiply. We have many more cores uh, on a single chip which we can utilize. So if our programs cannot be faster by just running on faster CPU, uh, obviously the solution would be to parallelize our programs because otherwise we are not actually utilizing the hardware. So that's the easy part. Um, the, bad, the bad part is the fact that races until C11, uh, C++11, were actually undefined behavior, and there still are, uh, without atomics. So any times you have two different threads accessing the same memory location, and one of them is writing, we have undefined behavior, all bets are off, your code is completely broken. And you might not even know about this. And there are really good reasons, reasons for this undefined behavior. Uh, one is cache, um, the really fast memory we all know and love, and we can't actually get to utilize correctly ever. And the other is optimizations that you normally do want. So um, this is the architecture of the simplest cache. Um, for x86 TSO, uh, where each CPU has its own cache. And when you try to read a variable, you're basically checking, is it in my cache? If it is, then you read it from there. Great. Uh, if it's not, then you actually have to go all the way to the RAM and read a value. Now, when you're going to write a value, you're writing it to the cache. And at some point in the future, um, it's going to propagate to the RAM. But you have no, uh, no idea when it's going to happen. So what could happen is that um, the, the values that you write are going to be in the cache and you're going to read something uh, stale from the RAM since the RAM hasn't been updated yet. So that's one of source of trouble. The other one is optimizations. Something that's really useful. Uh, if you've been to the previous talk, um, it showed the difference between uh, ordering and the matrix. But um, in general, uh, we have a matrix summation. So we want A plus B equals C we could do it in two different ways. Uh, we could uh, iterate over the columns and then the rows, and we could iterate over the rows and then the columns. Now, from a mathematical point of view, this is exactly the same. There is absolutely no difference. But from a uh, memory access pattern, there is actually a huge difference, since if we iterate by rows and then columns, we basically iterate over the memory sequentially instead of jumping, jumping around. So we make better utilization of the cache, so it's going to be faster. Now, so the compiler is allowed to make this optimization and reorder the loops so we can get um, a lot better uh, performance for a program. Now, uh, what we're going to see now see is what happens if we write our code and expect um, to iterate the matrix in a very specific value, uh, way. Uh, we're going to expect that they are going to be, uh, be done by the uh, column order. And then another thread is going to actually wait until some other value in the last column is going to change. And obviously, by the time it changed, um, it should have iterated logically over all the metrics by this point. And because we iterated plenty of values, it should have been cache flushed. And everything should be fine, except it's not going to be. OK, so here we have our metrics example. Uh, we are going to have two threads. Um, we're going to have uh, three arrays, uh, A, B, and C. They are going to be initialized. Uh, A is going to be ones, B is going to be twos, and C is going to be zeros for a start. And then our uh, summer is going to basically just iterate over the columns in ascending order and over the rows in descending order. Uh, very handcrafted for this uh, example. But you know, maybe some lowering of your code end up, ends up with something weird like this. And we have our summation. And in the meanwhile, uh, the watcher is going to wait until the last column, last row is going to be something that's different than zero. That means that uh, the summer should have uh, processed everything to this point by now. And once it happens, it's basically going to sum the uh, first row, uh, first column. So we start by compiling this code. And it's running, and hooray, we get our 30K, which is the exact uh, number we were expecting. Great. 
So we figured out, yeah, let's, let's optimize the code. We want it to run faster, right? Everybody wants faster code. So we go with O2 and run our code again, and uh, it's broken. That's 11K. That's completely wrong. So the obvious solution would be to look at our code and figure, oh, you know what happens? See this Y loop that we have here? Um, what happens here is that um, the compiler can reason about the fact that we read the value, and it's not going to change anywhere, so we can just read it once. Um, and then whether we read uh, zero or non-zero, it doesn't matter since it's going to be an infinite loop. Infinite loops are undefined behavior. We can just remove them. So we're basically not waiting for the value to change ever. So just go ahead and read it. So the obvious solution to prevent the compiler from optimizing the while is? Volatile. Volatile, exactly. So we change our code and we use volatile. Uh, to make sure this loop isn't going to get optimized away, and we actually wait for the value to be something that is dif different than zero before we actually process it. Go back to our code, uh, compilation, and I'm mistyping volatile apparently, multiple times. Well, uh, yeah, there we go. And we run a code, and great, 30k again, everything is fine. So we figure, hey, why shouldn't we be cracking the optimization further? O3 should definitely be faster, right? Everyone loves O3, or loves to avoid O3 because it creates all kinds of problems because the code is incorrect. Oh god, 663. This is even worse than what we had before, like, what just happened? Um, and the answer is, compiler optimizations happened. Um, originally, before we were doing um, our optimization, the compiler wasn't actually optimizing the loops, and we had our very expected memory pattern where we were accessing the, the arrays by columns. And the compiler said, oh, this is in inefficient in terms of memory access. We really should be reordering this. So the compiler said, yeah, I can just read it in chunks from the ba back end and get it to run faster. Um, there's only a slight problem that uh, the first value we change is actually our sentinel value that we're expecting to change only after we finished everything. So this means we just skip everything and just sum it before the summer actually managed to do anything. So yeah, undefined behavior for a very good reason, you want these optimizations normally. So not all is lost. STD Atomic comes to rescue. Um, it gives us defined uh, behavior for data races, uh, so we wouldn't actually have this kind of behavior. Um, by default, we get sequential consistency, which I'm going to describe soon enough, and it's really easy to use correctly. We basically have an STD atomic of our type, so if I want an atomic int, I'm just going to write STD atomic int and x, and then all our accesses to it are going to be atomic uh, in a very invisible fashion, like I'm just going to write x equals to five, or int a equals to x, and I'm going to read or uh, write values to x atomically. No other re uh, change is required. Um, another thing we can do with, read atom uh, with atomics is read modify write op operations, which means we can um, read the current value and possibly change it to something else in an atomic fashion, which means no other uh, write can interject in between. Um, so, as we probably know, x plus plus is done atomically, incrementing the value. Um, and it's completely different than what would have happened on normally, which is reading the value and, incremented, and writing an incremented value by one. So we have um, fetch and add, which is the increment. We have uh, exchange, which writes uh, a new value and reads the old one. And we have compare and swap, which changes the value uh, only if it's equal to something we expect. Uh, a really powerful building, building block. Um, so what is sequential consistency? It basically means that you can consider um, the executions of the program by um, simple interleavings of uh, statements from the different threads. So examples are always the best. Um, this example is called the store buffer. We are going to start with um, X and Y global locations being initialized to zero. And the first thread is going to run, uh, write 1 to x and read the value of y, and the other thread is going to write 1 to y and the, read the value of x. 
So what could happen? Uh, we could, for example, start by writing one to x and update our memory. Um, then we're going to read y. We read zero because nothing changed yet. The other thread writes one to one y at that point. The memory gets updated. And now when we read x to b, we read one. Great. Um, similarly, we can have uh, a mirror image of this by running in the exact opposite way and end up with an outcome of b equals to zero and a equals to one. Another option would be to start with writing one to x and then one to y. Um, now when we're going to read x and y, we're basically going to read ones and this is also a valid execution. Uh, what cannot happen under the semantics we just defined is we can't actually read zero for both A and B um, because there is no ordering that we can actually read zero for them before we wrote one. Are we all good here so far? Great. So we can go back to our matrix example and then now we change our C matrix to be uh, a matrix of atomic synth instead. And then every other part of the code is going to be the same. Uh, we actually re re revert back to um, the earlier watcher where we didn't actually have to make any changes um, like making sure it doesn't get optimized away. And then we got just um, compile our code. And with O3, we still get our 30K. Correctness restored. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem is we lose a lot of performance when we do this because um, all these um, sequential consistency accesses, um, they force cache flashes because we need to make sure the different threads have the exact same view of everything. Um, they prevent statement reordering, uh, which could um, botch your memory access. So there is a lot of performance we put on the table uh, when we do this. So this is where C++ memory model comes to rescue us. It provides us with weaker accesses um, that are cheaper. Um, they're not going to be as costly. The races are still going to be defined. We can still reason somewhat uh, about the correctness of our program. But there is a price to pay. Nothing comes for free. And the price is going to be synchronization. So let's see what happens. Um, but before that, um, for our access, we're going to require explicit access now. We are basically going to require a store statement. Um, this is a member function of Tombic. And we're going to give it the desired value that we want to write and the type of member access, uh, where the default was a sequential consistency so far. And similarly, for reading the value, we're going to have to use an explicit load and tell it what kind of load we want. So it has explicit access to make it harder, more annoying to use, since it's more error prone. So let's start with the cheapest kind of access, relaxed. It's the cheapest atomics. Um, it gives no synchronization whatsoever. And <laughs> uh, but it does provide us with one guarantee um, that the writes are going to be monotonic. Uh, we have total orders of the write for a specific location. It doesn't say anything about any other location. So if we start with x be equal being equal to 0, and the first thread is going to write 1 to x and then 2 to x, um, and we're going to read x twice in the second thread, we're guaranteed that they are going to be, in this example, uh, monotonic, because we cannot um, read from an earlier write if, uh, of a write we already read. So if I already read from this x, x equal to 2, um, I can no longer read um, the value of 1 for x, because it was overwritten, and I know it was overwritten. But um, for different variables, uh, we can reorder um, all the write access and load accesses, um, and I'm um, just, uh, so you know, um, this is an approximation. It's actually more complicated than just reordering. And if we have time at the end, I might show you. Now, um, no synchronization means that if I wrote 1 to x and then 1 to y, I can read the value 1 for y, but I can still read 0 for x for the initialization. Again, if we think about it in terms of all reordering, I basically changed the order of the writes, for example. So I first wrote 1 to y, and this is why I was able to read it before 1 was written to x. Um, because this is too weak, we require something for synchronization. Um, release acquire uh, comes to the help. And what it does is basically every write release operation um, is going to tell me about everything that happens prior to that. 
so that if I read with an acquire operation, and it's very important for the release and acquire to match, um, then I'm going to become aware of everything that happened before the write. So specifically in this example, which we're going to see a lot today, uh, if I read this value of one, then I can, I'm no longer allowed to read the value zero for x. I must read this uh, one for x since um, this right of y tells me that this happened in the past. Um, another thing we have is fences. Um, fences are, allow us to synchronize trends, and in general, they are stronger versions than the release acquire and uh, uh, S consistency over the variables. And we're executing with atomic thread fence and the type fence, and in general, again, you're going to use sequential consistency, I hope. So, for example, if I would like to use a release acquire fence, I'm basically going to have a write really, uh, all the writes uh, and reloads with relax but I'm going to put a fence release here. And what it means is that any write um, that happens fence this fence release is going to release um, all the stuff that happened before the fence. So I could have Y, Z, and P or whatever. I'm going to write it. If, and if I'm going to load any of them and perform a fence acquire, then I'm going to be, uh, these two fences are going to synchronize and anything that happened before um, the fence release also happened before the fence acquire. So it forces the same kind of synchronization. Now, an important note um, is that sequential we can have a sequential consistency fence, really useful, but uh, you might have a wrong intuition that um, the fence causes cache flush. It's wrong. It might be an implementation detail. In general, what happens uh, if you require synchronization is to have two fences synchronized with each other. So the SE fences are going to be ordered, and this ordering is going to define which fence happened before which and what kind of synchronization happens in between them. Uh, a very, uh, and if we put an SE fence between every two statements in the program, we basically restore sequential consistency because everything is going to get ordered. And one more important thing. You shouldn't be mixing um, release, acquire access, uh, release, acquire, and relax accesses with sequential consistency accesses, especially if you're going to do it to the same memory location. Things go horribly, horribly um, wrong there. I mean, it's defined if you can manage to reason about it. Um, but I find it a lot harder to reason about it. And there is an example that you probably don't want to see, like uh, for how horrifying it is. OK, so. We can go back to our example and theoretically improve the performance. Again, we have the same uh, C is still atomic, but this time um, all the writes are not going to be sequential consistency. We are going to use uh, explicit store statement over C and say that the writes are going to be release. And this means that the writes are going to be, again, in the same very specific order. So the compiler won't be allowed to change the order of these writes. So it won't be allowed to do the optimization we saw earlier, which broke everything for us. And since we have a write release, uh, we need to synchronize. So our while loop is going to be a, lo a loop with load uh, with acquire. So we actually have this synchronization between the variables. And if we read something that is different than zero, this means that uh, we read a new value and because it's, and it's going to require changes. So now we are allowed to read with relaxed uh, all the other values and we're going to get our correct values. So yeah, theoretically faster. Um, I'd be faster, I didn't time it, but we still get correct result. So all good so far. But the thing is, uh, we actually allow new kinds of behavior. So if we consider, again, um, the store buffer example we saw earlier, um, if we're not going with, to run with sequential consistency, can we actually run uh, and get a zero for both and it B? Under sequential consistency, you see, it's not possible. But under release acquire, under relaxed, it's a very res valid result, and we can actually obs observe this under real hardware. So I have this uh, example that I've written here. We're basically going to iterate many, many times until we can actually observe uh, the pre previously unobservable, as we're going to try and get our store buffer to work for us. 
Now, I should mention that the store buffer doesn't actually require optimizations um, since it's trust, uh, trusting the uh, cache to do this kind of behavior, but uh, it should improve the time we're going to we have to wait until we get it. And suddenly things change on my machine, so it's actually even... Uh, oh, wow, we were lucky. This was fast. Uh, three seconds only, and only 53,000 iterations. Okay, so it's not common. It means we're going to have to run many, many tests to actually find these kinds of bugs. Good luck. But you know, not everything is lost. We just need to have our continuous integration run it nonstop forever, and we'll probably find it if anything is broken at some point, you know? I think it might be a plan. There is only a slight problem, you know? Testing isn't enough. Uh, if we are going to test on one architecture, specifically x86 TSO, we are not going to be able to discover all the bugs because x86 is actually stronger even the release, than the release acquire fragment that we um, introduced. And ARM and PowerPC have weaker memory model and can exhibit even more kinds of uh, stuff. Oh, and virtual machines are not a solution because I tried to get the next example running on a virtual machine and I had really bad luck because, you know, the virtual machine doesn't have to give you all the weak behaviors. It just has to give you a subset of the behavior that is allowed by the hardware. So good luck with that. So um, this example we actually saw earlier is called message passing. And under sequential consistency, we can't read one, zero. Um, under release acquire, we can't read it because we have the synchronization. But with the relaxed semantics, where we have no synchronization, we can read this value. So we go back. Next again, example. Exactly the same idea. Um, I also have a line as to actually manage to put them on different cache lines so I can actually get, it, uh, get this working. But the, it's the same idea exactly as earlier. Um, so might as well let my CPU crunch some computer time trying to get this example running because it's not going to work ever. And instead, oh, I forgot. Ah, yes, network unreachable. I forgot this part. So I have an ARM server set up for this that hopefully uh, we are going to get to work. If not, uh, we have a recording just in case. Yeah. 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 So exactly the same program. We are compiling it, it and running it. And oh boy. Oh, sorry. Screen space. Smaller. <laughs> yeah, uh, and yeah, it happened after 139,000 iterations. Uh, that's actually fast. Um, in other times I tried it, it, was, it took a lot longer. So we're really lucky this time. Uh, but you're going to have to define your luck, you know. Trying to meet this kind of behavior isn't really the fun part, but it happens. And if we go back to the, you know, this, my computer, x86, it's still running, and it's going to run until it reaches the threshold, which basically is going to get, tell you to give up. So yeah, testing might not cut it. And you know, but maybe you have the weakest possible hardware that is going to implement exactly all the kind of crazy behaviors we saw. You know, it's still not enough. Current compilers are actually afraid of optimizing atomics. So while your code might work right now, it could break in the future when compilers finally start to optimize things. <laughs> yes. So again, the same matrix example we have, but this time um, our store is going to be relaxed and we are going to read again with relaxed. Now, because these are relaxed, the compiler is allowed to reorder the statements um, because it's defined. But if we're going to go back there and compile this, uh, yeah, we're not seeing the bug. 30K, 
So we might run, oh yeah, it's working, we're never seeing the bad results, but it's actually broken, and maybe some compiler in the future will finally optimize this, and suddenly things are going to break, and you're not going to ever figure out, why did upgrading the compiler break my code? Because you are writing wrong code in the first place. Don't do this. It's not healthy. Okay. So maybe us simple people cannot reason about this, but you know, maybe experts. Experts should be, uh, should be knowing what they're doing, right? I mean, I hope they do. So let's um, go to uh, story time. Um, in 1981, Peterson proposed a, a, a code for a critical section for a lock that has two threads, and it assumes equation consistency. And you know, somebody asked at some point, what if I want to implement this with the C11 memory model? Hmm, what could go wrong? So, um, how many of you ever saw Peterson's mutual lock algorithm? Not many. How many of you remember the lock? None. Great. <laughs> so, um, short course about uh, Peterson lock. And the idea is basically that we have three common variables. Um, two of them are going to be flags, uh, one for each thread that are going to state uh, I want to enter the critical section, so I'm going to raise my flag. And if I don't no longer need the critical section, I'm going to turn it off. And the other variable we're going to have is a turn, basically stating whose turn it is um, to be in the critical section. So when a thread wants to enter the critical section, it first said, hey, I want to, turn it to enter the critical section, I'm going to turn my flag, and I'm going to be a really nice uh, thread and say, you go first, you know, I, I can wait for you to be in the critical section. And this uh, you go first actually makes all the magic uh, of the, this algorithm work. Well, I'm going to see, uh, when I try to enter the critical section, I'm going to see if you want to enter. If you don't, then I can just enter the critical section. I'm free to do it. But if you do want, then I'm going to check whose turn it is. And if it's your turn, I'm just going to wait for you to finish uh, run the critical section. And then you're going to say you no longer need it. And if it's my turn, I'm just going to enter the critical section, and you're going to be in a loop waiting for me to finish. So it works if we assume sequential consist consistency. So um, in 2008, um, Bartosz Milewski um, proposed an implementation of how to do this. And he used release acquire accesses, he used exchange statement. We are actually going to look at it uh, a bit more in detail later. Um, Dmitry Vyurkov um, saw his past. Uh, and says, you know, your memory ordering in your implementation of Peterson's algorithm is both insufficient and excessive at the same time. It both permits uh, races and you still have unnecessary fences. So, worse of both worlds, you have unneeded synchronization and you still allow races. Um, and in turn, Dimitri proposed his own implementation for how to do this correctly. Um, Bartosz's response was basically, uh, I don't have a formal proof that what I'm doing is correct. Um, I believe my implementation is to be, is to be correct. Uh, for all I know, Dimitri's implementation is also correct, but it's much harder to prove that it's actually correct. So yeah, correct, proving correctness isn't easy. So subsequently, um, Anthony Williams analyzed both of the algorithms and concluded that Pratosh's implementation uh, was actually incorrect, and Dimitri's implementation is correct. But there was a side result that is even more interesting about all this. Uh, all these experts agreed on one thing. Any time you deviate from sequential consistency, you increase the complexity of the problem by orders of magnitude. So apparently even experts don't really want to touch this because it becomes really, really hard. Um, so before we continue, let's see uh, what was Bratosh implementation and what went wrong there. So this is uh, the locking algorithm. And we see that um, the flag change was replaced from store to an exchange statement, a read modify write. And otherwise, everything else is identical except we use release access and acquire access. So the first thing that went wrong here is the fact that we have this exchange statement. Um, ex exchange statement um, is a read modify write. It works really well if somebody else is, uh, is going to write this value. The only problem is that um, whoever is going to write uh, this flag is only this specific thread. So it's just going to read its own value. So this acquire means nothing. It could have been a store just as much. OK, but maybe you can fix this. We can replace it with store. Maybe it's going to store correctness. Um, 
But then again, we are going to look at this. Um, and I colored it, and something should jump to your eyes when I color it like this. If you think about this exchange as being a store, and this is a load, we have release and acquire here on both sides. Should look familiar to some of you? Maybe. It's the exact sto store buffer we saw earlier. So yeah, it's possible that they're going to write both of them that I want to enter the critical, the critical section, but when they're going to check it before that, does the other thread want to enter the critical section at this point? And they're going to see, no, it doesn't. Uh, and they both enter the critical section at the same time. Okay, so there is that. Uh, it's really easy, easy to say it in insight, but trying to design this correctly is hard. But you know, maybe even the experts um, might have hard time with it. You know, maybe if we wait long enough, like all the way to 2020, maybe someone is finally going to solve this problem. And luckily these guys did an amazing job defining uh, formal logics um, that can actually reason about the correctness of C11-like programs and really cool stuff. And just to show how hard this problem is, um, they had a case study in their paper, specifically for Peterson's algorithm, specifically for this implementation of Dimitris. So it's like, you need a formal paper to prove that the algorithm is correct. But you know, and they proved that both of the threads cannot be at a critical section at the same time, which is awesome. Isn't it what we want for a critical section? Normally it is, uh, except there is only a slight problem. They proved uh, an important property, but it's actually not enough. Um, and the implementation is still uh, incorrect. And we are going to see why soon enough. So let's consider uh, Dimitri's implementation first. So what did he do? Uh, first he changed the exchange. Uh, instead of having it over the flag, it's actually over the turnout, which is going to save us from the store buffer. And, but it did weaken some of the accesses, so writing the flag here is going to be relaxed uh, with the idea that if I read that um, you don't want to enter the critical sec, you want to enter the critical section, then I don't really need to synchronize over it because I'm not going to enter the critical section until I saw that you don't want to enter the critical section. And this is going to be with a release, so it's going to be fine. And this is why we, in the while we are doing uh, an acquire load. And the other place he weakened is the turn, uh, which basically means that when I'm checking just if it's my turn or not, I can probably do it in a weaker fashion. Now, um, if you're going to try to reason about it, we are not going to find um, uh, that the two threads can access the critical section at the same time, um, mostly because um, the exchange over the turn uh, forces us um, to read uh, to have a definitive order over the, the rights to exchange, and this uh, uh, in turn is going to be releasing all the time the flag that the other thread is going to want to enter the critical section. So where does it break? Um, we're going to start from a clean state. Um, both threads are going to wish to enter the critical section. And the first thread is going to say, hey, I want to enter the critical, critical section, and you go first, you know, I I'm a nice person. And then I'm going to check, do you want to enter the critical section? And say, yeah, you don't. So I can just enter the critical section. Now, the other thread wakes up, decides, hey, yeah, I want to enter the critical section. So I'm going to raise my flag. And I'm going to say, you go first, because that's uh, what we do. And then it's going to read um, the flag and see that thread one wants to enter the critical section. It's actually in the critical section right now. So is going to enter a busy loop soon enough, but first he's going to have to read something else. And before he's going to read something else, the turn here, uh, in the middle of the while loop, is actually going to get uh, swapped out, and the first thread is going to run again, the second, actually, and is going to unlock the, uh, the critical section. I'm done. But you know what, I need to enter again. So I'm gonna turn on my flag again. And you go first, because that's how things go. Now, what happens here is the turn right now is zero, so thread zero is going to be allowed to enter the critical section. So he loads the turn and says, oh, it's my turn now, great. Uh, only one problem. is in the critical section and no synchronization happened because you see this um, load we had, it's relaxed. 
This means it's not getting synchronized with anything that happened in thread one. And this means that there is a race between um, both critical sections. So again, we are back into the realm of undefined behavior without them being in the critical section at the same time. I mean, it, it should be mind boggling, like how we are going to reason about this. It's like, what? And yeah. So yeah, uh, maybe quantum task computer scientist, I don't know. Um, this is where my research tries to attack my, the problem. It was published in two papers, uh, Robustness Against Release Acquire Semantics in PLDI 19, and Verifying Observational Robustness Against the C11-like Memory Model in POPL 21. And the idea is verification against weak memory model is notoriously hard. We just saw it. Um, experts can get it wrong. Uh, miss cases, computer scientists can get it wrong. Um, proving correct properties is just insufficient. Um, so we would like to verify correctness assuming sequential consistency. Um, so that if we prove that the program is uh, correct in terms of sequential consistency, which we can at least more reasonably reason about, with considering all the interleaving, and some prop magical property about the program, then we're going to actually get our verification under the weak memory model. And this property, uh, we call it robustness. And what it means is basically that all the possible behaviors that the program could exhibit under the weak memory model are those that it could exhibit under sequential consistency. So even though it's actually going to use weaker primitives, and run on weaker hardware, we are actually not going to see any weak behavior. We are only going to see sequential consistency. And this means we can reason about it in terms of sequential consistency. And as long as it's correct under sequential consistency, it's going to be correct under the weak memory model. And we uh, focused on the C++ and 20, actually, memory model, because there are changes over the years. Um, it didn't stay the same. There were bug fixes over the years. And what we wanted to do is actually um, establish this robustness automatically. So um, before we can continue, um, all these nice graphs I was showing you are actually graphs that are uh, used to describe uh, execution of the program. So it's not actually, s uh, we don't describe it by this statement was executed and this and then that. We basically uh, describe it with graphs that says which events took place and what kind of relations they have between them. And the memory model describes um, what kind of cycles are allowed or disallowed on the graph. So if we go back to our message passing example, um, we start from uh, having all the program, the registers are equal to zero, and we have an initialization graph with only the right events uh, where x and y were initialized to zero. And because they are initialization, um, they don't have any uh, definitive meaning of which one happened before the other. And when we execute a statement, writing one for, uh, to x, for example, we create a new um, event in the graph saying that one was written to x. And it happened strictly after the initialization in terms of program order. Then when we are going to write one, um, this write of one happened again strictly in the manner of, uh, strictly after in terms of program order after this uh, writing of one to x. And now we are going to read uh, the value of y, we need to justify uh, the value we're going to read. For example, if we want to read one, we can't read it out of thin air. We need to, write, to read it from somewhere. And we justified it by reading from ri this right that we wrote one to, one to y. And finally, when we're going to read x, we need to justify it. We're going to read zero, and we can read from the initialization. Nobody said otherwise. Um, it does imply a relation um, that uh, we had to read the zero before it was overwritten. Right, because it g this value gets overwritten with one later. So we have this implied relation. And this uh, cycle, which we have um, one was written to x before one was written to y, before we were able to read this one, which happened before we read this zero for x, which happens before it was overwritten, um, is a cycle that is disallowed under sequential consistency. But under the relaxed memory model, no problem whatsoever. You can have this, sure. So what we know is that actually that um, if uh, we can take the events of the graph and linearize them, then we have sequential consistency. The graph is going to be sequential consistent. So this graph over here, the top, uh, the top one, uh, we can linearize the event saying first 
the initialization took part, then we, the first thread took part, and then we read one for a while in the second thread. So it's a, it's a question of consistency. But uh, the other graph um, is as inconsistent since we cannot find any such linearization. And I should mention, uh, we need one linearization. Multiple might exist. We don't care as long as one exists. For example, we can just change the order of the initialization. It doesn't matter. So uh, we proved that uh, robustness against 11 is decidable and piece is complete. And the idea is that we've done this with reachability under sequential consistent semantics. This means that um, at the start, our graph is going to be consistent. It's only the initialization. And at some point, uh, we have a minimal uh, violation. At some point, it becomes as inconsistent. But the idea is that a step prior to that was consistent. So this is the point where things break. And we can actually, uh, it means that we can run an SE machine and reach a matching state. And we can actually track this, uh, the fact that the C11 machine can take a step that the SE cannot. And attach it to an instrumentation to our SE machine. So we're going to run with a sequential consistency machine that's going to track what would have happened if I was actually running this on the weak hardware model without using the weaker hardware model. And with this, we're going to actually be able to uh, find the point of divergence. So again, if you consider this graph, this state was SE consistent. This means we have a matching SE machine that can reach this stage with a uh, state with uh, our instrumentation. And yeah. And we find that um, the C in the C11 machine we can read from initialization, but under sequential consistency, we must read one for X. And therefore, we report a robustness violation. It can exhibit new kinds of uh, behaviors that y you're not expecting under sequential consistency. So we built a tool called Rocker, uh, which allows us to uh, automatically uh, statically establish the robustness of uh, programs written in a TPL, toy programming language, um, that captures the semantics of the C11 memory model. And the robustness is um, verified under sequential consistency. This means that we don't actually need the weak hardware to find uh, the issues that we have. Um, so we run, uh, at first we started with the Relic Sequire fragment. And under Relic Sequire, um, Peterson's lock is broken, and so is Bratosh's implementation. But if we use Relic Sequire, um, Dimitri's implementation is actually going to be correct. And the store buffer isn't robust, but message passing under uh, Relic Sequire is. And the amazing thing is we found all these results without actually having to reason about the programs and in less than two seconds. You know, at all this time it took to establish the correctness of these algorithms and figure, you know, just don't think about it. Just let the program tell you if it's robust. If it's robust, you can actually think about if it's correct under sequential consistency. And then we went a step further and used the relaxed semantics where we noticed that Dimitri's implementation was actually um, incorrect, it's not robust, and we looked why and saw that it's incorrect as well, and proposed two possible fixes on how to restore the correctness of Peterson's. So to conclude this part, um, we created a tool called Rocker, taking um, C-like uh, atomics and non-atomics, generating a, prog a problem in language called Promela, which the spin model checker verifies whether it is uh, robust or not with some question consistency. Um, the tool is available for you to uh, play with on GitHub. You can, you can just try programs. You don't actually have to understand the memory model. Just run it and see if things are working. And we are going to show an example. Let's start with the metrics one. So um, here uh, we have the metrics, um, there's no support for arrays. Uh, it might get implemented at some point if, if somebody cares enough. Um, but it's the same idea. We are going to write our writes um, in the very specific order that we had earlier. And then uh, we use wait for the while loop again um, to wait for the value to change to be 3. And then we read and sum, a sum and assert the fact the value is actually 9. And we're going to have a matching example, which is basically going to force those uh, right releases and 
the, low to, uh, the weight to be acquired. So we actually have the synchronization we expect. And So we can just let it run with all the examples I have here, um, including Peterson's implementation for both uh, Bratos and uh, Dimitri. And we can actually see that fairly quickly get results that um, Dimitri's implementation uh, wasn't robust, but the proposed fixes do restore robustness, and in turn, the correctness of the algorithm. So in general, very nice stuff. Um, just another word about what went wrong with proving the correctness of uh, Dimitri's implementation. Um, basically, what everybody considered, um, they were only thinking about single iteration of the lock. So the first thread tries to acquire the clock, the second thread tries to acquire the lock, but once they release it, yeah, we're done. We finished everything. And the program, would, we couldn't see the, uh, this problem if we only see them trying to enter the critical section once. We actually did them to do so twice in order to actually um, see that the critical section don't synchronize. So we also support while true loops. So again, um, it's bound in terms of the memory, but we can use unbounded loops to check the correctness. Um, and if you wonder, um, the put two possible fixes are either to make the acquire and the, the flag loading uh, in acquire, or if when we enter the critical section, execute a fence acquire. The, these are going to restore the correctness. Okay, next part. It's not a solved problem. The specification isn't perfect yet. There are actual real problems, and we can theoretically create values out of thin air. So before we uh, continue, um, there is a data race freedom statement that should be very intuitive to you, that we expect that if we have no races under sequential consistency, then the only outcomes that are going to be allowed by the program are going to be those of sequential consistency. And the problem we had with all the prior example was basically we had races. Uh, we were accessing the same uh, memory locations from different threads. But if we are not going to do this, we expect to have um, sequential, uh, sequential consistency. So for example, uh, if we have this code where the second thread is going to read the value of y, and if it's going to be 42, then it's going to write 42 to x. And the first thread is going to read the value of x, and if it's 42, it's going to write it to y. So under sequential consistency, the only obvious solution is to read 0 for at least one of them, and then the ifs are not going to get executed. So they are going to they are going to basically end up with zero for both of them, both of the reads and the memory. Um, but things are not as simple as we would like. Um, this is called the load buffer. Um, we are basically it's the same program just without the ifs, and because ARM allows this um, uh, load buffering, we can actually have B read 42, and then we're writing, we're writing X 42, and A is going to read this 42 and write it to Y. So we have this, basically, 42 is written to X before we read this value of Y. So since it was written, A reads 42, writes 42 to Y, and thus we read 42. We have this um, cycle here. And because it's allowed on real hardware, the specification would allow to allow it because otherwise we are going to pay um, in terms of performance. So what's the problem? The problem is that this program we saw earlier has the exact same execution graph. So in terms of look, trying to look at the spec, there's actually no difference. So you cannot tell the difference. Um, and things were horrible um, back in C++11. This was actually allowed, just not encouraged. You shouldn't be doing this, but you're allowed to. C++14 decided, no, you shouldn't be doing this because it breaks all kinds of assumptions. People assume that if there are no races, then there shouldn't be any unexpected behaviors. And the thing is, we can't tell the difference. And it's actually getting worse. Um, since if we remove the ifs, 
and we are not actually going to write 42 explicitly in the program. Uh, we are going to have writing just the value that we read, you know, this graph, the execution graph, is still matching this program. But 42 isn't even written anywhere in it. This should be very disturbing. And all we right now have is a side comment, a remark in this specification. You, you can't have this, but I'm not going to define what exactly this, how exactly you prevent this, figure it out. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer. I have some backup slides. Yes. Okay, so the question was uh, whether ownership could help us um, absolve these problems. So um, the answer is no. Um, since all of this is defined behavior by the spec, and actually the Rust memory model uh, is based on LLVM memory model, which in turn is based on the C++ memory model. Everybody uses the same memory model with slight, with slight variations. Um, Again, but it, it's not a question of ownership since these values are global, so they're going to live through the entire program. You don't have a problem of who owns the variable. You just have defined races. Very defined races. They're safe. You, you know what's going to happen. Just you don't expect it to happen. Any other questions? Okay, so might as well go to the backup slides. Um, so I mentioned the fact that you can't actually reason about this in terms of um, statement reordering, right? So here we have um, a force threaded program called IRAW, independent reads from independent writes. And what's going to happen is that we write 1 to x in a realist manner and 1 to y in a realist manner. And there is no um, definition, definitive order between them since there are going to be releases of um, two different threads. Okay. Now, where it gets interesting is that this thread, number two, is going to read um, X with a choir and then Y with a choir. And the third thread is going to read Y with a choir and X with a choir. And what we're going to see is that the first thread is going to read one for X, but zero for Y. And the other thread is going to read one for Y and zero for X. So no matter how much you try to reorder and define order of the statement and change them to get this behavior, you can't. You can only see it if you reason about in terms of graphs and what kind of synchronization you have. And you might think you're just making this up. Like, no, there is no way it exists. Uh, and I wish I would have been able to show you this on um, real hardware. I actually had um, access to PowerPC cluster. Um, sadly, I wasn't able to easily reproduce this, but these guys did. You know, the specification allows this. They weren't able to see it on Power 5. They, but on Power 6 and Power 7, they did see it, and it was really rare. Like, try to get this behavior. If you ever encounter a bug based on this, good luck finding it. I mean, you're on your own. I I'm not going to help you with that. Right. Any other questions? <laughs> 